No, it's, there we go. Good morning again. Uh, I want to welcome you to our uh, first CISRIC 3 meeting and uh, appreciate the time you all have spent in, in coming together for this uh, for this council. And uh, I'm, ple I'm Glenn Post. I'm pleased to serve on the council as well. I'd like to uh, thank the FCC for chartering CISRIC 3 so quickly after uh, CISRIC 2. We have some very important issues to follow up on. CISRIC 2 uh, folks did a great job in preparing for, for this next step. Uh, we have a, a number of very important issues around public safety uh, and homeland security, including emergency type services, especially that we'll be uh, looking at with this group. Uh, a lot of 911 related uh, information we'll be looking at and, and providing recommendations to uh, the FCC and others. The uh, This is a group that I believe can show that the public and private sectors can come together for very important uh, work, very important uh, recommendations that can benefit the, the, uh, the nation and our industry as well. So uh, I want to thank you especially for uh, serving on this committee. I'm glad to, uh, to be able to serve as well. Um, at this time, I want to introduce Jamie Barnett, Bureau Chief for the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, who will begin uh, this morning's session. Glenn, thank you so much. I'm going to uh, stand uh, primarily so I can have my notes far enough away from me that I could actually uh, actually read them. So, um, really, good morning, and thank you for uh, being here uh, as we open this next chapter in the Communication Security Reliability and Interoperability Council. On behalf of Chairman Judith Chinikowski, the Commission, the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, I want to thank you for giving us your time and expertise as we begin to tackle. Uh, some of the issues that are, are very important to the reliability and security of our nation's uh, communications infrastructure. And I, I'd also like to say that I uh, really appreciate um, uh, the fact that we have such an outstanding group. I mean, the, the previous CISRIC uh, panels, I don't want to take anything away from them, but uh, if you look around the room, you will see that you and your colleagues here are just all stars in your field, and that's why uh, it's so important that we have you here to tackle these, these important things. I especially want to thank uh, our new chairman uh, of the CISRIC, Glenn Post. Glenn, we're really looking forward to your leadership over the next 18 months uh, as we address these challenges and the questions that we placed uh, before the CISRIC. As I mentioned, uh, Chairman Janikowski sends greetings. He sincerely regrets that he's not here to, to join you today, uh, but he really did want to communicate with you, and he's uh, sent a letter to you as the council uh, that I, and asked that I present it to you now, and I will read it. Uh, addressed to Glenn Post uh, and Chairman Post and the members of the CISRIC. Thank you for your important service as part of the rechartered Communication Security Reliability and Interoperability Council. I particularly want to thank Glenn Post of CenturyLink for serving as the chair of this group and, and Admiral Jamie Barnett and his staff for putting together today's meeting assisting CISRIC. Last month we experienced two major events that put our nation's communications infrastructure to the test. A hurricane and an earthquake in the Northeast within a five-day span. These events confirmed that the Americans are more and more relying on newer forms of communications like mobile phones and broadband internet when a disaster strikes. As the FCC has reviewed these events, it's clear that our communication systems in general worked effectively and played a critical role in emergency response. For example, after Hurricane Irene, wireless communication showed a remarkable restoration rate of almost 40 percent per day for cell sites. Cell sites that were down because of fiber optic cables went across washed out bridges were quickly reconnected via satellite links. And while 911 traffic to a small number of public safety answering points, or PSAPs, was routed to backup facilities, no PSAP was completely inoperable. However, the hurricane and the earthquake also shed light on areas where we must continue to work to strengthen the reliability of communication networks, and especially our mobile networks during and after disasters. For example, Americans increasingly rely on mobile communications, with more than half of all calls to 911 originating from mobile devices. But some wireless networks experienced serious congestion following the earthquake, congestion that prevented some 911 calls from going through. An increasingly mobile, in an increasingly mobile world, that is unacceptable. That is why today I'm charging CISRIC with re recommending ways to ensure that 911 is available when disasters spark a surge 
and mobile network use. That includes how 911 traffic might be prioritized in such situations. The Commission will benefit from your knowledge and expertise with communication networks, public safety, and consumers. We look forward to receiving your guidance regarding issues that would be implicated by a, prior, a prioritization system for 911, including ways for PSAPs to address operational issues. I'm also directing CISRIC to develop best practices to ensure that communication providers are prepared for natural disasters and are able to restore service quickly in their aftermath. CISRIC has, over the years, created best practices in a number of important areas, including 911 reliability, cable damage, cybersecurity, and disaster planning. Today, I ask you to do so again to enhance consumers' access to communication networks during and after natural disasters. I appreciate all of the other matters CISRIC will take up, including developing recommendations regarding facilitating the deployment of next generation 911, expanding the development and testing of E911 location accuracy, and improving our existing set of E911 best practices, as well as considering how to address cyber threats. Your work is of vital importance, and we are grateful for your service. You have my sincere appreciation for, and thanks for being generous with your time and knowledge regarding these critical public safety matters. Working together, we can ensure a stronger, more reliable, and innovative communications network to enhance our nation's security. Sincerely, Jews Janikowski. At the FCC, we realize that we have the good fortune to never have to act alone. Uh, we rely on the brain power and initiative of you, our partners and colleagues in the private sector, uh, other government agencies, and nonprofit organizations. The CISRIC is a, a manifestation of that cooperative spirit. The threats to our nation uh, continue to multiply both in number and variety. In addition to crises stemming from natural disasters and physical acts, we now face threats uh, even more nefarious. Uh, cyber exploits that can disrupt or cripple our communications network, as vital sectors such as finance, energy, health care, and transportation increasingly rely on uh, broadband communication networks. Uh, cyber exploits pose threats to virtually every area of our lives. This CISRIC will dive into the cyber waters to find ways to improve and hopefully uh, secure weaknesses in the system that will make these exploits, uh, that even make these exploits possible. And I'm certain that with your help on complicated technical issues such as securing the domain name system, the development of secure internet routing solutions, botnet and malware remediation techniques, and general network security best practices for communication providers, we can make great headway in strengthening the nation's communications infrastructure. We also appreciate your assistance in our ongoing efforts to keep 911 and alerting systems in step with technological developments. Your work on NG911, E911 location accuracy, next generation alerting, and uh, CAP migration issues will go a long way to improving public safety. As uh, the chairman said in his letter, we will also be asking this CISRIC to apply um, the lessons learned from recent natural disasters uh, to strengthen communications resiliency. We aspire uh, to a communications environment that is even more robust in the face of traumatic events, permitting, peop uh, permitting people to, in distress to reach help quickly and reliably. On a related note, the FCC recently opened a public uh, technology experience center here at the FCC uh, in our library, and September is Public Safety Month here at the Tech Demo. I encourage you, while you're here today, to visit and view some of the latest developments uh, and great things to come in public safety communications. It's right down the hall, and we will be glad to, to show you where that is. Uh, I think it'll be an, an, um, uh, a very interesting thing to you. Uh, so again, what, uh, I appreciate your presence here. I mentioned uh, looking around the room at the All-Stars. We also have All-Stars on the phone uh, on, the, on the conference bridge, and you'll meet them in just a minute as well. Uh, I think that you will find this uh, an interesting and informative and challenging uh, journey for all of us. And uh, with that, thank you for this time to speak. And, and uh, Chairman Post, I turn it back to you, sir. Thank you, Jamie. Remarks. This time I'd like to uh, allow the introduction of the council members and ask you to introduce yourselves. Please remember to speak into the mic. We have folks on the bridge, so we come to uh, your time to speak. But that's, uh, we'll start over here with, with John. If you will, just go around the table and we'll go to the bridge, please. Introduce yourself. Where are you from? Good morning, John Wick with uh, Centerverse Technologies based out of Tampa, Florida. Uh, we 
we do a lot of work in the area of transaction processing in the mobile ecosystem, whether it's uh, critical signaling traffic or messaging traffic. So I'm very, very interested in hearing what we're going to talk about today and how we can um, you know, leverage some of those ecosystem assets to enhance the 911 experience. Good morning, everyone. My name is Christian Vogler, and I am the director of the Gallaudet University Technology Access Program, the TAP. And we are working on making sure that the deaf and hard of hearing community is able to use the telecommunications technology. So my main interest is making sure that those people who are using emergency communications and in receiving emergency alerting, a warning, to make sure that that is accessible to people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Good morning, I'm Dan Trainer. I'm Chief Information Officer at Tennessee Valley Authority. We're the uh, nation's largest public power producer uh, based in uh, the Tennessee Valley, serving parts of seven states. If I'm not mistaken, this is the first time that the uh, electric utility industry has been uh, represented on CISRIC. Probably something that's a bit overdue since uh, we're critical infrastructure providers, but look forward to the opportunity to serve. I'm John Thomas with Sprint Nextel, and I am sitting in for Bob Ozzie today. Good morning, Craig Spiesel. I'm the executive director of the Online Trust Alliance. We're uh, a nonprofit, including industry business and the uh, private public sector, advancing best practices to uh, preserve online trust uh, through best practices, voluntary guidelines, and effective policy. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dorothy Spears-Dean, and I am representing the Virginia Information Technologies Agency. I'm an employee of the Commonwealth of Virginia. My role is the Public Safety Communications Coordinator, and one of my primary responsibilities is to manage the Commonwealth's 911 program. I'm Bill Smith, uh, technology evangelist with PayPal. Uh, I work in our um, uh, cybersecurity and information protection organization. Um, primarily focused on internet standards and governance um, and doing a lot of work in the cybersecurity area. Uh, PayPal itself and the organization I'm in is also interested in improving the security reliability uh, generally of the internet and um, recently we've taken um, a bit of an interest in um, sort of the convergence of wireless broadband um, and uh, also have attended a couple of meetings on public safety and public safety's use of those technologies moving forward, which we think is quite interesting. <coughs> uh, my name is Richard Shockey. I'm the chairman of the board of directors of the SIP Forum. We are a leading group of service providers and manufacturers of communications gear uh, centering on the session initiation protocol, RFC 3261, which is the basis for all real-time communications now on IP networks. Good morning. My name is William Sagel. Uh, I am the Director of Information Technology for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. I'm here today representing Major County Sheriff's Association, which is a consortium of large county law enforcement agencies. Good morning. Bob Ross, uh, CBS Broadcasting, Inc. Please go home tonight and watch our network. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the Senior Vice President for East Coast Operations, and this is my second CISRIC, and I also participated in uh, MSRC 1 and 2. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rod Rasmussen. I'm President and CTO of Internet Identity, a cybersecurity company. Um, we have particular interest in DNS and BGP infrastructures, as well as uh, we do a lot of operational work in the realm of uh, botnet mitigation. Uh, I also personally do a lot of uh, uh, policy type things with ICANN and other organizations that uh, uh, are trying to uh, uh, work together to solve these problems. Good morning, I'm Steve Wisely, the Director of Comm Center 91 Services for the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials. Uh, uh, like Bob, uh, EPCO uh, was very active in the, the prior CISRIC, and uh, we look forward to this also. 
My name is Brad. My name is Brad Ramsey. I'm the general counsel for the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. That's the state commissioners in all U.S. states and territories. Uh, I'm here representing Commissioner Maureen Harris from New York State. We have jurisdiction over all the critical infrastructures, power, electricity, water, and we're very concerned about interdependencies, also very concerned about reliability and security of all the infrastructures and, of course, emergency communications. Good morning. I'm Damon Penn from FEMA. I'm the uh, Assistant Administrator for National Continuity Programs, and one of my programs is the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, IPOS. Hi, I'm Alan Paller from the Sands Institute. Jamie was right. This is a, an august group of, of uh, leaders. It's very, I'm honored to be here. Sands is a college and training organization. We have about 120,000 alumni in 70 countries who do the very, very advanced security stuff, attack and defend training for the intelligence agencies, the military. But I'm, um, I'm looking forward to, ser I serve on a lot of these, I'm looking forward to serving on one that actually gets things done. And it sounds like this is one of those that, uh, that actually makes progress. So thanks for the invitation. Hello, I'm Michael Ridden. I'm chairman of the Messaging Anti-Abuse Working Group, which is a global ISP organization covering something in the order of um, over a billion mailboxes. Um, we've been, we were founded in 2005 and we really work to provide best practices for the major ISPs and also the major senders in areas regarding things like combating bots and also working on spam. Good morning. I am not Susan Miller. Um, unfortunately, Susan could not be here this morning uh, due to international travel. Uh, I'm Tom Good. I'm general counsel with Addis. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about Addis uh, through our presentation this, this morning. We're a standards development organization doing a lot of work with the 911 uh, outage uh, uh, areas. I'm, uh, uh, good morning, I'm Danny McPherson, I'm Chief Security Officer with VeriSign. Uh, very interested in critical infrastructure, availability, uh, and certainly cybersecurity, heavily involved with those things. Uh, good morning, I'm Wayne Payson with the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. I'm filling in for Steve Malfors today. Uh, I think probably everybody in the room realizes that the financial services sector has a critical dependency on telecommunications. So. We would like to contribute in any way that we possibly can to help strengthen the security and reliability of telecommunications. Good morning. My name is Elise Kim. I'm International Executive Director of 911 for Kids, public education, but not just for kids. And uh, we're really honored to be a part of this and look forward to um, assisting with uh, training the public. Uh, good morning, I'm Rodney Jaffe. I'm the Senior Vice President and Senior Technologist of Newstar. Uh, we operate the local number portability database uh, here in North America <laughs> and operate some DNS infrastructure uh, that powers a fair bit of uh, the commercial world. Uh, my major uh, interest is cybersecurity, uh, particularly DNS and routing, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to be involved in the working group that will hopefully provide some best practices around that. Good morning. Good morning, I'm uh, Christopher Homer from DirecTV, Los Angeles Broadcast Center, and we are a content provider, and uh, this is my first time on the council, excited to be here. Good, mor Good morning, uh, Chris Hillebrandt uh, with T-Mobile USA, one of the leading wireless service providers here. Um, this will be my second CISRIC, glad to be here. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Hightower. I'm with Cox Communications. Cox is the third largest cable company, but we are also a telecommunications provider on all um, various platforms. This is my second time to be on CISRIC, and I am also happy to be here. Thank you. Brent Green, President, Telcordia Technologies. Uh, Telcordia has participated in a long series of CISRICs, and before that, NRICs, and we look forward to supporting this process. I'm Jim Fowler. I'm with the City of New York, First Deputy Commissioner for Information Technology and Telecommunications. My interests here are to make sure that our 8 million citizens and our millions of visitors have access to the emergency communications during the times that need them, as well as looking at, um, at some of the other ways that our constituents want to communicate with us through the social media. Thank you. My name is Brian Fonts. I'm the CEO of the National Emergency Number Association. It's the second time I've served on CISRIC with a great opportunity of serving with. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Lori Flaherty. I'm the coordinator of the National 911 program, which is housed within the U.S. Department of Transportation. 
Good morning. My name is Chris Fisher. Uh, this is my second CISRIC as well. Uh, last time around, I was the sitting president of APCO, and this time around, uh, I am representing uh, my employer and local regional 911 centers. Uh, I work at NORCOM 911 as the executive director uh, in the suburbs of Seattle, Washington. Good morning. I'm Andy Ellis. I'm the chief security officer for Akamai Technologies. Uh, which moves about 15 to 20 percent of all web traffic on a daily basis. So we're very interested in the reliability uh, of the internet, especially during times of crisis. Good morning. I'm Stu Elby. I represent uh, Verizon, which is a large communications and entertainment and security provider. And our interest, of course, is uh, to improve the resiliency and reliability of uh, the communication structure here. Good morning. My name is Brian Doan. I'm with the Office of Cybersecurity and Communications with Department of Homeland Security. Thank you. Hi, right, Tim DeFogge. I'm the Director of Cybersecurity uh, for Depar uh, Department of Health and Human Services, Indian Health Service, and uh, former Director for uh, Program Director for uh, U.S. Intelligence Agency. Good morning. I'm Craig Donaldson. I'm the Senior Vice President of uh, Regulatory and Government Affairs for Entrado. Entrado is a company that does uh, services and infrastructure for phone companies and public safety agencies. Uh, uh, we provide all kinds of services, uh, soup to nuts, access to call delivery. And uh, this is my second CISRIC, and, and Entrado has been involved in NRIC, and we're happy to be uh, continuing participants. I'm Lynn Claudie, Senior Vice President of Technology at the National Association of Broadcasters. Uh, we are the trade association for radio and television stations and networks. This is my second tour on CISRIC. Uh, in their uh, role as first informers, we're representing the interest of, of broadcasters who, who certainly, uh, with uh, security, reliability, and interoperability of the emergency alert system as it moves into its next generation form, are uh, vitally interested in the work of this committee. Good morning. My name is Uma Chandrasekhar, and again, it, it uh, was a pleasure for me to be here again, as I've also had the opportunity to participate in the earlier CESRIC committee, and I am actually Vice President of Bell Labs Alcatel-Lucent, uh, focused on area of security, reliability, and eco-environmental engineering. I'm here representing TIA. Good morning. My name is Bill Buckholtz. I'm the chairman of the Texas 911 Alliance. We provide the infrastructure that supports over 400 uh, public safety answering points. Hi, everyone. I'm Ed Amoroso. I'm Senior Vice President at AT&T, where I serve as the Chief Security Officer and also manage the intellectual property business. I'm still Jamie Barnett. <laughs> Morning. I'm Jeff Goldthorpe, and um, with Public Safety Bureau here at the FCC, I'm the designated federal officer for CISRIC. Thank you. I think we have uh, four or five folks on the bridge. If you could uh, introduce yourselves, and uh, we'll try to do it one at a time, best we can. But if you could do that now. I'm Jack Doan. I'm, re I'm representing National Association of Chief Information Officers. I'm an employee of the state of Alabama. I'm also a member of the National Public Safety Telecommunication Council and a steering committee member for P25. Hi, this is Karen Wong. I'm the Deputy Director for Public Safety Communications with the California Technology Agency, and we're responsible for the state's 911 system as well as the state government's um, radio systems. Hi, I'm Brett Kilborn, Deputy General Counsel of Utilities Telecom Council. UTC has been around since 1948. We represent the telecom and IT interests of utilities and other critical infrastructure industries. We're just pleased to be here and echoing the comments of Mr. Trainer earlier. Uh, we think we have a real contribution to make here. Thank you. Hi, this is Doug Davis. I'm Chief Technology Officer at Hypercube, also a CIVIC and a prior Enric alum. I'm looking forward to the contributing in this one as well. Good morning. Uh, this, is, this is Jacqueline Randall with the state of Washington. I'm the IT branch manager, and I'm looking forward to being here. And this is my first CISRIC meeting. Hi, this is Donna Bethea Murphy with Iridium uh, Communications. I'm Vice President for Regulatory Technology. Iridium is a satellite-based uh, PCS 
company and we provide communication links to phones and small devices in areas that uh, it's hard to communicate otherwise. Thank you. Anyone else on the bridge? Well, thank you very much. And I, I agree with uh, Jamie's earlier comment. This is an impressive group of folks here, a lot of brain power in this room. And uh, with Alan's comment earlier, we want to, we're here to, to uh, accomplish some things, get some things done, not just to talk. And uh, that'll be my primary objective to be sure that what we do here is, is work that can be uh, taken to another level that can actually be implemented uh, to improve. Uh, communications and, and public safety and homeland security uh, in the months and years ahead. I uh, want to just say uh, how much appreciate Jeff Goldthorpe here to my right. Jeff is uh, his leadership in this group and uh, he's done a lot of work and will continue to work with us on here in this group and uh, Jeff thank you for uh, what you mean to this this organization. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Paula Silberthal. Uh, attorney advisor in administration law division of the FCC Office of General Counsel and she'll provide a procedural overview of, of the CISRI. Paula? Good morning. Um, let me join my colleagues in thanking everyone for being here. Um, I agree that the goal is to get things done and um, while sometimes legal talks aren't scintillating um, and some of you have heard me give this little speech before but the key point here is that the FACA operates under statutory constraints. And there have been cases recently that have rejected reliance on uh, recommendations from FACAs that might have met for a year or two because there were procedural defects. So I'm just here to give a couple of pointers to keep everyone on track so that if you come up with a great recommendation that someone doesn't like, that it can't be challenged in court for being for procedural problems under the statute. So that's why it's important. If as you're going along, you have any questions about, you know, are we doing it right? Are we following the right procedures? Are there any issues? Please make those questions, no matter how tiny you think they may be known to Jeff, and either he'll answer them or he'll give someone in our general counsel's office like me a phone call and we'll try to resolve those issues for you so we don't sort of step into any little tiny legal traps. Um, the guiding principles of FACA are openness in government, diversity and balance in membership, and public accountability. Um, towards this end, uh, meeting notices have to be provided 15 days in advance um, in the Federal Register, although we try to make things accessible through public notices, websites, things like that. If Jeff sends out a notice saying, is such and such a date good? Please respond, because if it turns out we set a date and we publish it in a week before, a quorum of the committee write back and say, oh, I didn't see the notice and we can't meet and we have to cancel it and we need to reschedule for a different date, that's hard because the major thing that people can look at is whether the meetings are published in a timely manner so the public can attend. So you can help Jeff with that. Um, meetings will be open if you are going to discuss anything as a group here that you think is confidential um, that has that might be classified government materials serious trade secrets raise security concerns uh, and you know that in advance let Jeff know because it is possible with advance notice to close portions of the meetings we don't advise doing that. We'd prefer to have open discussions, but I can see given the kinds of things you might be discussing that there would be a possibility for having things that weaknesses in security that you don't want advertised to the universe and you might want to discuss in a closed meeting. If you think that's a problem, let Jeff know in advance and we'll examine it and see what we can do about it. But you can't get sort of halfway into the meeting and say, there's something important I want to discuss, but we're going to have to close the meeting. No, that doesn't work. Um, documents uh, are made publicly available. That is a requirement of the statute. Um, anything on which the subcommittee relies, anything that's distributed to FCC staff, um, anything you distribute at these meetings uh, is public. There, are, there could be potentially certain exceptions. Again, if you have something you consider highly confidential, uh, talk with Jeff 
before you put it on the record. Uh, you could submit something with a request for confidentiality. We would try to give you our view of whether it would sort of qualify in advance so that we could protect it. Um, but again, you know, heads up, just do a little screening and think about things before you turn it in. If you have something that's uh, highly confidential and you provided at the meetings without any notice or request for confidentiality, it's open. It's going to go in the public record. It might be posted on our website. You know, that's just something to be aware of. Um, the role of your committee chair and your vice chair would be to serve as another focal point for your concerns. Um, the chair, along with the DFO, would establish your working groups through which a lot of research work and recommendations to the full committee are accomplished. Um, and the chair working with the DFO will conduct all the meetings. So this is your go-to person. And um, you know, take advantage of that and try to communicate through him and Jeff any concerns you have. Um, just want to mention the DFO is a critical person. The DFO has to approve all the agenda meeting, uh, for the meetings, not just the full meetings, but your working group meetings. Um, the DFO will attend all of your meetings and uh, work to chair them, will maintain all the records. Um, so, but you know who Jeff is, but just in case you don't, he's sitting right here. Um, the informal working groups is something that's worth mentioning because a lot of your work gets done through this. Um, under the regulations of GSA, you can work informally without advance notice. You can have, you know, less than a quorum of all of you, smaller groups to get work done, to make recommendations to the full group, to draft reports, to discuss preliminary findings. Um, what is really important actually is what informal working groups can't do and this has been subject to some litigation and is sort of one of the what I call the trap areas. The informal working groups can only make recommendations and then those recommendations or reports get submitted to all of you and need to be reviewed and debated, discussed. Uh, explored by the full committee and there have been occasions in the past where the working group rep recommendations are just sort of rubber stamped they're not evaluated people think well you know the subgroup I know those guys they're really smart and we're just going to sort of like look at it and just approve it without thinking too much or discussing it those have been situations where the, where FACA has been violated so you really want to be sure, even if you don't think it's maybe your finest area of expertise, to read those things closely, to ask all the questions, so that there is a full record at this level for any recommendation that uh, comes out. And that's really important. Just as an aside, there's been legislation for the past couple of years that appears to be bipartisan um, that would abolish informal working groups so that there wouldn't people could do research and maybe draft some recommendations, but basically everything, every single small issue would be elevated to the larger group sort of in the first instance. Um, so those of us who work as counsel to advisory committees are just hoping <coughs> that there's a robust discussion at this level so that there's there's a basis for showing people that we don't need to abolish the working groups, that they're working as they're supposed to do, and that they're not usurping the functions of the full committee. And this is apparently something there have been, there's been a lot of discussion on, on the Hill. So, you know, be vigorous in evaluating your working group recommendations here. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning is that typically, um, FACA groups are subject, they are subject to the ex parte rules. So that in the usual course, if you're discussing in front of staff or commissioners anything of substance that goes 
to the heart of open docket proceedings at the FCC, even if it's in the context of like a working group meeting, um, typically one would need to file an ex parte notice. However, um, we have issued a public notice to make these kinds of informal communications exempt so you will not need every time you touch on something um, that is about an open docket you will not need to file ex parte notices um, however it also means that anything you say won't be relied upon so when the group as a whole comes up with recommendations if they go to something that involves an open proceeding um, CISRIC will need to file those recommendations in the docket of the open proceedings so that they would be able to be considered by the Commission and that obviously is the goal that you're going to make recommendations about things in which there might be some rulemakings um, so we've made it easier for you, but you just have to remember that if there's something important you want to get, or even a working group you want to get before the full commission, you will need to file it in the docket. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. Good luck. Thank you, Paula. Next, I'd like to introduce Robin Howard. Robin is with ADAS NRSC and will provide an overview of the NRSC uh, E911 uh, Reliability Project Report. Robin? Good morning, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, CISRIC uh, Council for allowing the uh, ADAS NRSC to come here and speak today. Um, ADAS um, and the NRSC has been part of uh, CISRIC, NRIC, and before that the Network Reliability Council for nearly two decades. So we were actually born of the Network Reliability Council in 1992. So we're a very intricate part of this process. Um, so today what I would like to do is just spend a, a little bit of time covering the uh, two parts, the NRSC and, and what we're about, and then also one of our most recent projects that we just completed, uh, which was a standard on 911 camera trunk throughput optimization and analysis. So first off, uh, so next slide, please. OK, so ADIS is the leading technical planning and standards development organization. And they're committed to uh, rapid development of global market-driven standards. Um, this uh, ADIS is made up of 600 industry professionals from approximately 250 uh, companies. And they're very active in forums, focus groups, and incubators. Uh, to enhance network reliability and resiliency. Uh, these groups are all comprised of leading subject matter experts in their field, and we use a very pragmatic, flexible, and open approach to how we uh, develop our standards, our white papers, and our documentation. The group uh, focuses on issues such as emergency communications, IPTV, cloud services, M2M, mHealth, next generation network services, interconnection, and so forth. Next slide, please. So what is the Network Reliability Steering Committee? Uh, the NRSC addresses network reliability improvement opportunities, and we do this in a very open environment. Uh, we are competitors, naturally, but when we come together under the NRSC, we work under a non-disclosure agreement, which gives us the freedom to share information that normally we would not share. And what that does is gives us a distinct advantage over many of the committees and forums uh, that allows us to uh, really get down to the to the problem uh, of a particular issue that's been brought to us. Now, uh, we do this in, as an opportunity evaluation process. We develop sub teams uh, based on the need. Uh, so recently, we uh, again did the uh, Cama Trunk project, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. But these are uh, subject matter experts from across the industry that we bring together which is an, an absolutely awesome organization that I've been involved with for over a decade. We establish these sub-teams to uh, work on specific reliability issues. We provide industry feedback to the FCC, uh, in specifically on their network, uh, network outage reporting system and their disaster information reporting system, which we call NORS and DERS. Uh, those are the primary uh, systems used to report outages uh, to the FCC. Um, so we're very interested and active in that role. 
and we also serve as an educational resource for the industry and the public when it comes to network reliability and resiliency issues. Next slide, please. The NRSC also initiates these special studies uh, related to infrastructure reliability. And over the past 24 months, some of these special studies are cybersecurity best practice review. Uh, we're very, uh, we, we partner with CISRIC. We've reviewed best practices that the CISRIC Council have approved. We improve on those so that they're easy to find, easy to use. <coughs> Uh, so we're, we're very interested in, in continuing that partnership with CISRIC. Uh, during the last CISRIC, uh, the NRSC created the best practice tutorial that we provided to the, NS, uh, to the FCC and CISRIC Council, and they used that uh, for, for all the teams to bring you up to speed on how to create a, a good best practice. Uh, there, are, there are several bad best practices that have been created over the past, uh, just in structure, not in content. So we we're there to help uh, try to structure them so that they're as usable as possible and that they're understandable by as many people as possible. So uh, we do a really good job at that within the uh, NRSC. Um, we also have uh, done a normalization of reliability metrics for outage data. Uh, so that helps um, everyone understand the outage information that's being collected by the FCC and presented at the NRSC quarterly meetings. Uh, it helps everyone understand the, the ground rules. And, and when you're looking at that data, what does that data mean and how do you interpret that? Uh, so we've been involved with that. And then our most recent, again, was the NRSC camera trunk throughput optimization analysis. Uh, the NRSC actively partners with other organizations. Uh, for example, uh, the East-West Institute, uh, Worldwide Cyber Security Summit, uh, the NRSC, uh, myself and my co-chair, Stacy Hartman from CenturyLink, um, we actually participated in that uh, cybersecurity summit, uh, which was very interesting, a different outlook than what we normally would see. Uh, so we really appreciate that. Uh, Telcom Energy Alliance, uh, we've interfaced with them to share uh, and educate them on what the NRSC does. We've had uh, associations with the North American Telecommunications Damage Prevention Council. And then our most recent is the Association for Information Communication Technology Professionals in Higher Education, or ACUDA, uh, and uh, we're currently working on updating their hurricane checklist that was based off of the NRSC hurricane checklist that's available to the industry. So we're very interested and, and very active in uh, educational opportunities. Next slide, please. Also, uh, NRSC members are very active in CISRIC. Uh, we did last time have uh, NRSC members on most of the CISRIC uh, committees, uh, very active in that role. Uh, again, bringing our subject matter expertise to those teams, uh, trying to you know, make things as, as, as best as possible for the industry. Uh, and then the sec and the NRSC also establishes subcommittees uh, that are long-term standing. And, and the one I want to talk about today is our best practice subcommittee. Uh, this team is put together to not only review best practices that come from the CISRIC uh, and previous NRICs, but we also create best practices in between the CISRIC charters. So we're active at all times trying to improve, change, find new ways of doing things. Uh, and then as we get those complete, then we pass those to the next CISRIC for uh, voting by the members and get those uh, justified and get those on the website. Um, we, we spent a lot of time looking for ways to make the best practices easier to find, easier to interpret, as I said earlier. Uh, and then most recently, the uh, ADIS NRSC put online a new website with enhanced features for best practices, and we continue to improve that, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, working with the CISRIC Council on uh, in doing more enhancements there. Okay, next slide. And then um, basically this last slide is just the member companies that make up the NRSC. As you can see, there's a significant uh, representation from the major communication providers. Um, we're always looking for new members. Uh, so I heard CBS plug CBS, so I'm going to plug the NRSC. Um, the membership is uh, very valuable, and uh, you can contact myself, Stacy Hartman, or Tom Good. 
uh, at Addis, and uh, we can certainly get you hooked up, and uh, you would find it a huge benefit to yourselves uh, to be part of the NRSC. Okay, next slide. Uh, we're going to kind of go into the second. I want to spend more of my time here. Um, back in January of 2011, uh, I think there was a lot of people, especially that are in this area, that were aware of the heavy snowstorms um, that pretty much overwhelmed the 911 network in the Washington metro area. So being a Verizon employee, I was very intimately involved with that entire situation. And we uh, saw a situation occur that I'm going to discuss. Uh, we worked with um, the FCC and we've come up with a uh, mitigation plan that we have uh, implemented in uh, our company and other companies and during the earthquake I can say that that mitigation plan worked perfectly so we are very comfortable that we've come up with a with a good solid solution here so uh, to get into that if we go to the next slide please on uh, May 4th of this year the uh, FCC asked the NRSC to review a 911 service affecting issue where a sustained mass call-in event to 911 caused, caused a focused overload on the 911 system. Now what this overload did in certain selective routers was to cause all of the 911 trunks to systematically go out of service. And as fast as those trunks were put back in service, they would go back out of service. And what this did was reduce the throughput of the 911 trunk system and it caused several, you know, uh, quite a number of calls to go to uh, treatment and not make it to the PSAPs. However, the PSAPs themselves were, uh, as they said, very overloaded themselves. So any call that made it to the trunk got through to the PSAP. So this was a, a serious situation. So the uh, FCC asked us to take this on and we, we uh, very readily agreed to do this. And the NRSC created a sub-team uh, with participants from AT&T, CenturyLink, Cox Communications, Telcordia, T-Mobile, and Verizon. We then began holding uh, very high-level technical uh, discussions on this problem. Uh, we ran uh, many, many lab tests on this problem. We were able to confirm and come to a root cause on what was causing this problem. So as part of this review, we looked at the selective router to the PSAP. That was where we saw the problem occurring. And it did occur uh, in the lab testing with high call volumes. So we were able to reproduce the problem very easily. Uh, next slide, please. So what was the problem? Well, we in the industry call this a wink failure. or in this particular case, we call it a double wink failure. And the situation that we ran into was that, uh, there, that we determined that there was an inter-call uh, timing issue between the selective router and the PSAP, where the selective router had the ability to deliver a call to the PSAP customer premise equipment or CPE faster than the CPE equipment could respond. So when we offered up, or the selective router would offer up the call the the CPE did not acknowledge and that would result in a wink failure so we're looking for a a signal back within a, a very short period of time so then we would offer that call to the next trunk and if that next trunk is available then it will present and things will be fine but in a focused overload situation typically all the trunks are already busy so the call was being offered up to the same trunk a second time which resulted in a second wink failure because it was again being delivered too quickly and the selective router then simply assumes that trunk is bad it puts it out of service to prevent it from being used per design and at that point we've reduced the capacity of the trunk group between the selective router and the PSAP by one trunk one member and then this scenario uh, continued until all the trunks in that trunk group were able to be put out of service. So that then cut back the throughput uh, considerably. So that's what we call a double wink failure and that's why we were asked to look at this problem. 
Next slide, please. So upon two successive no wink conditions, again, the, the legacy, and again, this is legacy, not, uh, not next gen. Uh, we didn't test the next gen. But the legacy 911 selective routers would remove the trunk from service. It results in fewer trunks being able to handle and receive calls. And if there were no trunks available, the call was being routed to treatment or to an alternate route, uh, dependent on where the PSAP wanted it to go. So what was the root cause? So in our testing, and we found two, uh, several things. One is that this was an industry-wide problem. It was, not, uh, to, it was not specific to one particular service provider. So it was a, uh, an industry-wide situation. We found that the root cause originates from a timing or synchronization offset between the selective router and the 911 CPE that can occur during the periods of high call volume. It has a lot to do with abandoned calls. So as calls are abandoned, the call set up, uh, the, the time it takes the trunk to break down and reset for the next call was not long enough for the calls to be delivered, causing the trunks to be put out of service. And we also determined that all CPE types may be susceptible to this problem, that we did not identify a particular uh, CPE brand, uh, but it was uh, more one certain selective router type than, than others. And so, again, we determined that it, that it was a timing issue, and that led us to start developing a mitigation and remediation plan for this problem. So next slide. So as a result of our team, the uh, Addis NRSC published the uh, Addis Standard 010034, which is the 911 camera trunk throughput optimization analysis standard. And again, this document uh, provides recommendations to mitigate this condition of double wink failures and maximize 911 call throughput during periods of high call volume. So some of the, again, the document is very long, very detailed, so I can't uh, cover all of it here today. Uh, but some of the short-term solutions, just a couple that we were able to come up with, uh, was that wherever available, the 911 system providers, and that would be the service providers of the selective router, should modify their translations in their selective routers to disallow uh, the com complete trunk group from being taken out of service. So there are features in the switch in the selective router that allows you to say only take out 10%, 20%, 30% of the trunks and then refuse to take the rest out. By doing this, we eliminate that double wink failure from occurring and that call can still be completed when that uh, trunk breakdown and ready to go sequence to the uh, selective router uh, to PSAP uh, is back in service and ready to go. And we also then recommended that service providers update their procedures to be more proactive when they see these conditions starting to occur. Uh, in the selective routers, there are certain message types that uh, are a clear indication that a mass calling event are starting to uh, manifest itself. And by taking these messages, creating new alarming sequences for your ne network operation centers, we're able to see those mass calling events within a very, very quick period of time and be able to implement uh, mitigation as far as getting uh, back with the PSAPs, communicating with the PSAPs, and getting them uh, up to date on what's going on so that they can in turn uh, use whatever tools they have to get back out to the public to tell them to stop calling 911. We, we get it. We understand. Um, one of the things that we did find during this investigation was that the transition from wireline to wireless over time is actually adding to this problem and it's, it's creating this situation. Uh, in the uh, situation in January, the majority of the calls, if not all of the calls, uh, that were being sent to treatment were wireless and it was overwhelming the wireless trunk groups. Um, and in some cases, uh, PSAPs have different wireless, wireline, and VoIP trunk groups. Some have combined trunk groups. So it just depended on what PSAP was involved. And then some of the long-term recommendations that the NRSC uh, came up with was that um, we found that the PSAP standard documents that were created years ago when all these legacy systems were being developed are very silent on the inner call sequencing 
and the recommendations and the standards. So one of the recommendations is for CPE and selective router vendors to take this back internally and come up with standards, work with teams like or organizations like ADIS to come up with standards that will define the drop sequence and the uh, the on hook off hook sequencing of the selective router and, P and uh, CPE, which is again the documents are very silent on this, and we just found that uh, that was that was one of the drivers. Um, resulting in a particular uh, selective router vendor from not developing what we call um, a guard timer. And so this guard timer was not allowing the trunk setup to work correctly. And then uh, and finally, as a long-term recommendation, um, we suggested that as possible migrate off of the legacy 911 platform onto the next gen platform, uh, which again, we're not our conclusion was that we don't know this problem will not exist in the next gen. So uh, another recommendation was as you're going to the next gen vendors, as you're going to the next gen CPE vendors, uh, take this into account and make sure that um, you don't recreate this problem on the next gen technologies. So um, we, we did, uh, again, very detailed document. This document is available uh, from the ADIS uh, document library free of charge. Uh, so anybody can go and download that and uh, implement that in your own centers. So in summary, the NRSC finds that it, it, it's impossible to accurately forecast periods of high call volume to prevent a period of flooding the 911 system with more emergency traffic than they can handle or install enough network capacity to be able to handle all emergency calls during such an event. We find that with changing call patterns and more calls shifting from wireline to wireless, the situation may occur more often. But we do believe that if 911 selective router service providers and PSAP agencies take the steps outlined in the new ADIS standard, the 911 network will continue to operate as designed and not inadvertently or excessively remove PSAP trunks from service. Again, this document is available free of charge on the ADIS document library, and in the uh, presentation um, is the link for that. Or, Tom, do you know right off the top of your head what the, it's ADIS, uh, ADIS.org, I believe? It's right there. I'm sorry. Okay. And uh, the last slide is just the, uh, if there's any questions re related to NRSC, uh, the 911 camera trunk document, uh, you can contact myself or Stacy Hartman, uh, Tom Good, or Jackie Voss at Addis. So I thank you for your time and, and thank you very much for letting us uh, spend some time with you today. Okay. Thank you, Robin. It's a good report and uh, a lot of good work going on there. I uh, think Robin also introduced to us another key goal, key objective for uh, this council. He said, uh, Let's don't introduce bad best practices. Uh, so uh, I'm sure De Chairman Janikowski would have had that in his letter. He just inadvertently overlooked uh, that, that piece of it. But uh, thank you. And I've heard that this is really good work going on that uh, Robin and the team are doing there. Uh, next, we're going to have the chairs, co-chairs of the uh, working groups uh, report on each of their uh, respective uh, projects. Just a reminder that these uh, uh, Presentations are to be limited to 10 minutes or less, so if you go with that, I may try to kindly remind you to uh, maybe over, but uh, we'll, uh, we have a lot of presentations here and we're looking forward to those, but uh, we'll begin now with uh, the Next Generation 911 with uh, Brian Fonts and Laurie uh, Faherty. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, we're pleased to saddle up and write again, um, chairing this working group. Uh, the two of us chaired a working group 4B for the last CISRIC. Um, and this one, aptly named NG911, um, has the following work assigned to it. Uh, this 
has been tweaked slightly from what was posted. Um, so I will call your attention to it. Um, and this was done after discussion with our uh, DFO. But essentially the working group will uh, identify ongoing work related to NG911 uh, architecture, including standards development efforts such as NINA's I3 standard and others. And the working group shall label aspects of identified standards as uh, critical for deployment, critical for competition, desirable, long-term, or non-critical. Um, in addition, the working group shall identify any gaps in existing or developmental standards work and classify the important and urgency of resolving those gaps. So it's essentially taking a look at what, is, what already exists, um, giving it a level of urgency, and then identifying what gaps might exist in terms of existing standards. Um, in addition to that, the working group shall also identify criteria um, that signify the technical and or operational readiness of a 911 system to accept NG911 calls and data. So those are our two charges um, and uh, we've been asked to deliver those to this group at the next CIGIC meeting in December. Uh, I, I uh, believe after that uh, it is sort of up to this group as well as the uh, the steering committee and the chair with regard to whether or not you know, sub, sub, excuse me, subsequent work will be added to our, our tasks. Brian. Yeah, I, one of the important things is, uh, it's kind of the model that we're following. I, I happen to co-chair the Commerce Department Spectrum Advisory Committee, and one of the things that we're doing there is identifying very specific questions and then working on the answers of those questions and moving through the two-year cycle, in this case, 18-month cycle, to go through a series of questions that will be raised and answered so that there's work continually being done. These are the first two questions that uh, Lori had, had identified, and this was after consultation uh, with Jeff yesterday in the release of the FCC's order that they adopted yesterday to try to provide information uh, that or excuse me, notice of proposed rulemaking. <laughs> I'm way ahead of myself. <laughs> the notice of proposed rulemaking that they uh, adopted and released yesterday. So we did the modification to, in essence, provide information that could be submitted to that proceeding in, uh, in comments that were provided by the General Counsel's Office uh, where there are docketed proceedings and information can be used in those doc docketed proceedings will, in essence, ultimately be filing this in essence as an ex parte uh, or as a filing in that proceeding. So uh, this is an opportunity to do work in, that's relevant to an existing proceeding in an existing time frame in which that information could be included in the decision making process and deliberations of the FCC, which for those of us who participated in these types of processes before, it doesn't always dovetail so nicely. And so we're grateful for that. Uh, to Laurie's point about identifying additional questions, I think in large part uh, this will depend on what evolves in response to the first two questions. Uh, and also there will be an opportunity to look at questions and issues that have been raised in the proceeding uh, so that you can look at perhaps the reply comment round to identify additional work or additional questions that the working group itself may wish to uh, proceed. So, or work on and proceed in filing in the reply comment round. So it's a great opportunity. The time frame is uh, very ambitious. This isn't the first time we've been given ambitious time frames, but uh, nonetheless, I think it's pertinent to uh, the proceeding that's going on, and it's important that we work in a timely fashion. Okay. Uh, that was a quick list of the folks who have signed up to participate so far. There are 30-some uh, folks who have volunteered. Um, from what I understand, there are a few people out there that may still be interested in participating, and that is still possible. Um, short and sweet in terms of uh, what we've accomplished so far, I mean, given, the, given sort of like the timely discussion that Brian uh, mentioned, um, we have had discussions and decisions around basically organizational things with regard to the work of this group, um, organization of our work and, and timelines and deadlines. 
um, at this point we've d we've initially decided to split the group into two subgroups um, given those two tasks and and work from there coordinating the efforts of both of those groups as we move forward um, next slide could I just add a point there? Of course. Just because we're dividing into two working groups, it doesn't mean that you only can participate in one of those two working groups. You can participate in both. It's just your time will be a little bit hectic between now and December 8th. <laughs> um, and really, uh, in terms of next steps, we will complete the organizational activities of uh, people self-identifying to one of those subgroups and commence and complete our work. And I believe there is one more slide, but that is about it. Um, as far as uh, our next steps, our deadline is the next meeting. Yes, right. December of 2011. That is correct. Yeah. <laughs> it says 2012. Just, just to be perfectly clear, <laughs> it would be nice to have the 2012. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Brian or Laurie? All right, working group two is uh, Next Generation Alerting with uh, Scott Tollefson and Damon Penn, co-chairs. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Scott's going to be the uh, presentation. We were both uh, co-chairs at the last CISRIC, and uh, we too found that the, uh, the committee approach is the best way to uh, tackle the, um, the quite ambitious uh, program that we have on board. So, and the same as the, the previous group, we had invite anyone to participate in uh, any of the three committees and you're not limited to participation in one and exclusion from the others but uh, Scott please thanks David thank you good morning everyone um, working group two is responsible for making recommendations to the to the council on actions that the Commission should take to promote development of next generation alerting systems this work is intended to build on the development and introduction of the emergency alert system and the commercial mobile alert system. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> we are to consider a wide range of issues, including how alerting architectures that exist today or are in development may interoperate or interconnect to assure effective delivery of alerts. We are also to consider how these architectures do or might exploit various communications distribution platforms including the platforms used by radio and television systems, telephone systems, and the Internet. We are to develop recommendations on how alerts may best be presented to recipients using these platforms, along with various receiving devices. And we are also to develop recommendations regarding technical and operational criteria supporting the use of the Internet and other broadband-based architectures by participants in next-generation alerting. And finally, we are to develop recommendations regarding the role of social media in next generation alerting systems. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, and there are two slides, so please go to the, the one following as well. As of late last week, we had received the names of close to 20 persons who have been nominated for membership in the working group. They come from some of the many organizations that have a stake in the recommendations that this group will present to the Council. We understand that more nominations for membership have been received by the FCC. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, in addition, we are recruiting members <coughs> from companies and organizations in the sectors indicated on this chart. We urge council members to consider whether the organizations they represent would like to nominate persons to serve on this working group. With respect to the various distribution and receiving platforms, we hope to have input from systems operators, device designers, software providers, and others along the delivery value chain. <clears throat> we will take an expansive view of the potential use of the Internet in distributing alerts. We will study how social media and social networking activities might be utilized as effective methods of providing alerts. And we are also mindful that the forerunner to the existing and emerging alerting systems of today was implemented through broadcast radio and broadcast television because those were the most efficient ways to reach large numbers of people at once on short notice. Citizens today use the Internet to gather information and to interact in many ways. We are interested in exploring how the widest plausible variety of Internet-based services might enrich the process of giving alerts. Therefore, we will also look at the potential role of other Internet services that command substantial audiences, such as the online editions of newspapers and of radio and television services, the major online retailer sites, and the larger online entertainment services. We will also examine the phenomenon of so-called user-generated alerts that are provided not by government officials but by anyone who observes and reports emergency conditions. 
Next slide, please. Uh, we have decided to organize our work based on the categories of recommendations that we've been asked by the Commission to develop. And therefore, we plan to form three committees, uh, each of which is to focus on one category of recommendations. Next slide. The first committee is the Architectures and Platforms Committee. It is to develop recommendations regarding how various combinations of alerting architectures, distribution platforms, or transport infrastructures, and receiving platforms, or end user devices, may best present transmitted alerts to users. Next slide. The second committee is the Technical and Operational Criteria Committee. It is to develop recommendations regarding the technical and operational criteria under which next generation alerting participants can utilize the internet and other broadband based architectures. And the next slide, please. The third committee is the Social Media Alerting Committee. This committee is to develop recommendations regarding the role of social media and next generation alerting systems, including how governments may integrate social media into their alerting systems. And in this respect, the government entities that are responsible for authorizing alerts make up another important group of contributors to the activities of this working group. And we encourage persons from the government sector to apply for membership, to contribute to our understanding of useful information, and to participate in the development of our recommendations. And next slide, please. So we plan to commence our group activities promptly after next Friday, by which time we hope to have a larger complement of members. We will organize those members into the committees and select committee leaders, and then the committees will begin addressing the issues. Uh, in addition, we plan to use a dedicated web portal and webinars as tools to assist our working group in its efforts. Uh, last slide, please. So as these organizational steps are taken, and as we determine the level and types of efforts that will allow us to generate well-considered recommendations for CISRIC, we will set realistic timeline milestones. So in closing, uh, Damon and I urge you as council members to help us by nominating people to serve on this working group. Thank you. Thank you. Scott and Damon, appreciate that very much. Next, uh, working group three. 91 location uh, accuracy co chairs Steve Wisely and Craig Frost. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Steve Wisely. Uh, my uh, co chair, Craig Frost, due to business uh, uh, reasons, was not able to join me here today, but is on the, uh, on the bridge, I believe. Uh, I'll, I'll wait till we bring the slides up, and uh, there we go. And we can go right to the next one, if you would, please. Working group uh, three, uh, location accuracy. This is a kind of a, uh, a redo uh, for Craig and I. We uh, co-chaired working group 4C, so it's uh, in keeping with the tradition here of uh, co-chairs remaining the same. Uh, we're going to address uh, questions that were referred to CISRIC in the docket uh, 07114, the wireless 91 location requirements. We're going to be looking at specifically outdoor location, indoor location accuracy, and leveraging commercial location-based services. You will see that the duration of the uh, report uh, vary. Uh, we are scheduled to have, uh, in March of uh, 2012, the outdoor testing criteria. Uh, three months later, uh, the, uh, in June of 12, the indoor testing. And then we have something of a reprieve, and our uh, commercial location-based services are uh, due uh, in uh, March of 2013. Uh, the, next, the next three slides, and we can move through those fairly quickly, just list the uh, organizations that uh, are represented to date on uh, the working group. There's over almost 30 organizations that are represented and we uh, know that that number will continue to grow uh, somewhat. The, uh, the working group, uh, you know, the current activity we were asked to present, clearly we, we don't have too much activity. Uh, the the co-chairs have had a, a couple of calls already to discuss it. Uh, we've discussed the division of the workload as well as uh, we've got a conference call schedules that will be going out to all the members after the meeting today. And we've already f uh, targeted uh, a couple face-to-face -face sessions uh, because we know that from our past experiences with 4C that that's a productive way of doing business. Uh, the next slide, if you would, is pretty easy. We haven't really accomplished anything, but we're not. <laughs> <laughs> but we have high expectations moving forward. <laughs> the uh, 
the next steps, which I think are, are where you really want to be, is that uh, we plan to divide the, the, the group into three uh, subgroups. And we realize that the majority of people will be on indoor and outdoor, uh, but we'll be starting to work uh, with some uh, parallel processing. Uh, we'll uh, ask on our first conference call for uh, volunteers to uh, head up the subgroups. And uh, we uh, will continue on that first call to identify any additional members that might be necessary. Uh, we will, in fact, get the, 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 the schedule out of calls and we want to nail down early on uh, potential dates and locations for a couple of our face-to-face -face that we know we're going to need uh, early on in October and probably in the January time frame. If we would go to the, the, uh, the next slide, uh, as we said, we'll start the calls. We're going to do them every two weeks. The subgroups will probably uh, be uh, discussing their issues uh, on the off weeks and uh, there'll be a we, we found that in 4C, when we divided up the work, we had the subgroups do calls, and then we had general, everybody can be on the conference call. And we found that worked better because everybody then knew what was going on. There were status updates, and there were no surprises for anybody. And, and we think that that's a, a, a way that uh, we'll probably proceed. And we may very uh, well wind up with a couple additional face-to-face, -face, although we know that presents some challenges uh, especially for the public safety folks who have somewhat limited uh, travel budgets or none, none at all. Uh, we expect that the, the commercial location-based subgroup will start to meet by conference call uh, in the November time frame, and then uh, we'll develop a call, and you'll hear more at our next face-to-face uh, -face on where that particular schedule stands. And with that, I believe I stayed well with under my 10 minutes. Uh, Certainly did, Steve. Thank you very much for that report. Any questions for Steve? Yes. Huh? Steve, Steve, just a quick question. On the indoor testing, are you going to be first access as well as part of that? Brian, everything is on the table, I think, to begin with. Yes. Great, thanks. Any other questions? All right. Our next uh, working group report is Network Security Best Practices, Practices Group 4 with our uh, Rodney Jaffe. Uh, the mics are on. It's not there. Uh, so there are three working groups that are really intertwined, uh, working group five and six. Uh, that cover uh, DNS sec or DNS security um, and then uh, BGP security and this working group is really the one that uh, covers the area of what happens in the interim what do we do in the meantime so uh, it probably should have followed them but uh, you know, we, we, we are where we are uh, the primary problem uh, and I'm going to assume that some of the audience is more telco focused than uh, or TDM focused than IP focused so uh, Perhaps I'll give some uh, hints along the way. Uh, the major issue that we deal with is uh, within uh, the DNS and the routing world, uh, false answers are quite possible. Uh, the authentication of DNS answers, the DNS is the domain name system. It's the process that converts uh, domain names like www.amazon.com to an IP address so the computers can follow them. And the routing system is the mechanism that allows uh, the, the uh, packets to actually find their way to that IP address. Uh, in the way the protocols were developed historically, the concept of authentication was uh, not really uh, uh, something that was dealt with. Uh, probably 12 or 13 years ago, we began to see the issue uh, in terms of uh, DNS, uh, and the first DNSSEC working group was developed. Uh, what we're facing now is the fact that it's 13 years later, uh, and the bad guys have discovered that these are very, very good vectors for causing effectively mayhem on the Internet. And so uh, we're working very uh, uh, diligently to solve the problem. 
uh, the things that, uh, uh, the areas that, that, that where these problems manifest themselves are in things that many of you would recognize, fishing and farming, uh, DNS cache poisoning, and the hijacking of traffic on the internet. The next slide. Uh, the solution very clearly to uh, most of us in the industry is through uh, the process of DNSSEC or DNS security extensions uh, and uh, BGPSEC or the authentication of routing announcements. And those are going to be covered by, as I said, working group five and six. Both of them are critical to solving the problem, and we really do need both of them to solve the problem. Many of the issues you've seen over the last few, uh, a couple of years uh, within the internet when you see uh, uh, major criminal uh, operations, these two pieces were uh, uh, key to uh, the uh, criminals being able to do what they did. The challenge that we have is until they fully implemented from end to end, the problem is still going to exist. So we are, as, you, as you may know, uh, the route was signed uh, uh, um, about a year ago, year and a half ago. We now have uh, many of the top level domains, so the next layer down. Uh, many of the ISPs, uh, most, of the, most of the providers in this room over here, are already implementing DNSSEC uh, in their infrastructure. Uh, the problem is if the, the equivalent, the, the digital equivalent of the last mile, which is there are no end user applications or systems yet that solve the problem or make use of DNSSEC, uh, for example. And so we have to find a way of solving that problem in the interim. Uh, next slide. Um, the objective of the working group is to try and come up with some best practices and some recommendations that will give us some measure of relief as we wait for DNSSEC and BGPSEC or whatever comes of uh, those groups. We's not, I don't think we're even sure that uh, BGPSEC will be the solution. Uh, there, there are a number of issues uh, that are still uh, uh, challenging us, but uh, assuming that those do get solved at some point, what we want to do is to provide some best practices uh, and some recommendations for carriers uh, as well as other stakeholders in terms of what to do uh, until both of those are implemented. Uh, in terms of timing, um, uh, we're trying to obviously make this inclusive. It's not going to work, I think, like uh, some of the other working groups, but uh, this is something that's worked for us in the internet space. Uh, they seem to be blanks. Uh, if we can bring up the first one, uh, phase one is uh, going to be uh, to identify all of the stakeholders, uh, to uh, involve them in the process, to detail the problem space, obviously, and then to identify the challenges for everyone. We want to make sure that if uh, you know we have a perfect opportunity here to get involvement by uh, both the public and the private sectors. It's, it's more of a global operation. Uh, the internet, obviously, is uh, not uh, U.S. centric. Um, despite what some people may think. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we are able to identify all of the, the challenges. Uh, the uh, by uh, September of uh, next year, uh, um, to have identified all of the potential solutions. Um, <coughs> uh, phase three, which will be uh, December 2012, is to have a draft final report that will uh, hopefully get some uh, significant uh, involvement from the community as well as this council. Uh, to uh, make sure that we've covered everything. And then obviously uh, the final report, uh, which will be due in uh, March. Uh, as a uh, final thing here, uh, we're more than happy to take uh, additional uh, folks uh, onto the working group. Uh, you know, I think that uh, the carrier is a little underrepresented in what we have. Uh, we'd like to get more of you, so I'm going to be approaching uh, those of you who are involved with carriers to uh, nominate folks to join the group. Um, but this is one thing I will say is that this problem has been looked at outside of uh, obviously uh, this community for a uh, for, for a number of years now. Um, so there's a there's a large body of work already that's trying to solve the problem. Hopefully, this will be one of those times when we can actually come together as a community and uh, provide some practices for both the larger and the smaller carriers. Any questions? Thank you. Roger, good reporting. All right, working group five, DNSSEC implementation practice for ISPs, uh, Steve Crocker. Hello, good morning. Is this on? Uh, Richard Shockey has uh, graciously uh, offered me his seat, so I'm now sitting where he was. Um, there, there's an old joke, uh, a really terrible joke, about a kid who walks in to uh, buy an algebra textbook and the um, uh, 
the man says this will solve half your problems he says fine I'll take two and in that spirit uh, I, I'm following uh, Rodney's uh, uh, list of the two key things that are needed and I'm only representing half of them so you'll need a uh, solution from uh, the other working group for the other half uh, and uh, it's actually quite comfortable to be following Rodney rather than the other way around as you'll see I've made uh, use of his slides uh, slide one please so our our job is to uh, build recommendations for the implementation of DNSSEC uh, practices for adoption by ISPs DNSSEC is the security extension to the domain name system protocol next slide please uh, borrowing uh, directly uh, two slides from uh, Rodney's fine presentation um, there are uh, a series of ills some of which are related to routing some of which are related to DNS uh, weaknesses and uh, I won't I won't repeat uh, Rodney's um, uh, presentation which was absolutely uh, dead on next slide uh, as he mentioned DNSSEC and BGP security are both needed both critical uh, our job is to push forward on the uh, DNSSEC. Um, one small correction, the, the work on uh, DNSSEC uh, is actually more like 20 years old rather than uh, merely 13, although quite a few of the early years were um, design work and uh, hadn't quite made it to uh, public visibility. Uh, the work started with a demonstration of uh, cache poisoning um, out of the uh, uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center that reached the attention of uh, senior levels in the US government I was a vice president of trusted information systems at the time and got a call from my uh, from my old friend Vince Cerf and it was your classic call Steve we've got a problem um, and out of that kicked off the research to develop the uh, basic protocol went through a number of uh, uh, iterations in the de in the design community and is now in full swing um, in brief it's adding cryptographic signatures to every record in the domain name system and the checking of those signatures upon lookups not a small undertaking uh, fortunately um, there's been quite a lot of progress although uh, there's also a huge distance yet to go uh, on the signing side the root and all of the major top-level domains with the exception of China have been signed and China is uh, I think going to uh, sign over some period of time. I'll leave it to them to make their announcement. Uh, inside the U.S. government, there is formal directive from the OMB uh, that .gov is to be signed and all of the agencies under it, and .mil is uh, in the process of being signed this year. Um, that takes care of the top level of the infrastructure from a signature point of view. Uh, the enterprises are the next major wave on that side, and on the validation side, uh, it is primarily the ISPs and a number of other players, but with the ISPs in the in the leading edge, that have to uh, uh, move things forward. And so, this effort here is a, a very significant and very timely part of the process. Next slide. So this is, in in uh, very simply stated, this is the objective of Working Group Five to foster the deployment and operation of DNSSEC validation within ISPs throughout the U.S. Now, of course, this is part of a worldwide effort, but it's the scope of this working group uh, to focus on U.S. adoption. Next slide. Oh, I see. No, it's a build slide. Um, what do we have here implementation practices uh, put up all all of them okay phase one right so there's um, we've taken the uh, the nominal dates for the meetings um, tied to them are uh, three uh, sub phases implementation practices document uh, a DNS security performance metrics document and a status of the of those security performance metrics um, uh, we're still in the formative stage uh, we will try to beat these dates, but at the moment, uh, those, are the, those are the dates that we're advertising. Next slide. Uh, we have most of the working group members uh, recruited. A few more will be added. Uh, the primary uh, balance and composition of the uh, working group are senior technical people in ISPs and, and carriers. Um, there being less of a distinction these days than there used to be between those. And uh, senior technical DNS, uh, DNS uh, security experts. Um, uh, using facilities in my company to provide administrative and writing support and uh, as I say we're, we're just getting started the first conference call is in the process of being scheduled 
Uh, thank you very much. Happy to take questions, suggestions, contributions, um, whatever you like. Any questions? All right, thank you. Working Group 6, Secure BGB, BGP Deployment. Uh, How Andy Ogelski and Jennifer Rexford. Uh, so, good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm honored to be here, and I represent uh, Working Group 6. Uh, standing in for myself, uh, I'm Andy Ogelski, and for Jennifer Rexford, who is a co chairman of the group. So, first slide, please. Uh, next. So, uh, this is a rather verbose description of what the working group is supposed to do, not as verbose as some of the slides I've seen earlier. So I took the liberty of uh, underlining a few pertinent uh, phrases. Uh, first of all, uh, as the chairman of the two previous groups said, uh, there is a foundational problem in the way Internet infrastructure operates today, and that is that the f very first most critical protocol, interdomain routing or BGP for experts, uh, is based on trust. Second is that the protocol that makes it understandable to humans, or DNS, has also been based in trust. But DNS is much further advanced on the path to making it more secure by implementation of DNSSEC. So uh, BGP relies on trust. There have been multiple instances of varying significance where this trust has been compromised, resulting essentially in inability to deliver packets from source to destination. That's why this infrastructure is so critical. Two, uh, our working group has been tasked with recommending, a assembling a group of industry experts and recommending a framework how to transition from uh, today when and no secure b variant of BGP has been deployed in any large scale to a situation where uh, there is a visible and growing presence of secure BGP implementations. I say implementations because there is more than one variant today depending on what exactly is certified, whether it's the origin of the route or the entire path from source to destination, and they differ in complexity. Uh, Second, uh, the task is to recommend a process which is incremental, that is based on opt-in by service providers, and that has a strong flavor of a market-driven procedure. Namely, it's not a mandate, or God forbid, a regulation. Okay? It's all driven by industry consensus and will to grow. Uh, the duration of this working group is from now to uh, March 2013. I would also like to add uh, for clarification that this working group is not overlapping with the protocol work that is done by IETF and others. It is solely about implementing it in the wild. Next slide, please. Uh, we are in the process of completing the assembly of the group. Uh, there is more people in the pipeline, so it's not everybody on this slide yet. Uh, the intention has been to bring people f representing large network service providers, as there are some ideas among committee members that when certain number of large providers implements uh, one or another variant of secure BGP, the others will follow. The other group of great importance for us is content providers, or say hyper network operators, as some call them. Uh, well, Google. And I'm pleased to say Akamai has also agreed, and Andy Ellis will serve on the committee as well. Then there is uh, people from various other uh, groups in the industry and a government, and you can see the names here as well, including first responders, who maybe don't operate heavy iron routers, but uh, are dependent on them, and we're glad that uh, they came to us as well. Next slide, please. Uh, now we'll be very brief. This is a new group. So uh, we have uh, pretty much, we are coming to the end of the process of assembling the team, although I believe that this team has uh, a strong potential to grow and maybe change as we move on by adding 
other experts to the game. Two, uh, we have been going through the process of exploring the state of standardization, namely, if I have an incredible itch to, to deploy RPKI today, what do I do? Where do I get the stuff? And three, uh, implementing the state of implementation because uh, industry leading vendor routers have been working for some time on uh, preparing products, implementing RPKI. Next, please. So uh, what we have uh, achieved so far, well, uh, we are uh, grateful to uh, have uh, help of Randy Backman of FCC, who is assisting us with various technical matters and assembling technical documents uh, that subsequently will be used as a basis for writing recommendations. And moving forward, please. Next slide. Uh, what are the next steps? Uh, they are fairly obvious. I mean, that's, we um, are planning the kickoff meeting. We'll mostly work by teleconferencing as others. Uh, and in concordance with the members of the working group, we'll adopt certain more refined milestones, assign responsibilities, and prioritize recommendations for deployment strategy. Next slide, please. So uh, regarding specific steps and dates, uh, we will announce our regular meeting dates when uh, the members converge. Uh, the final recommendations are due at the end of our tenure in March 2013. However, we do intend to deliver uh, the final recommendations at the preceding CISAC meeting in December of 2012. Uh, I would like to stress, I haven't done it so far, that this process is intended to be supported by careful measurements and analysis of a variety of met measured metrics so that uh, the impact of implementation both before during and after can be asserted in quantitative manner. Thank you very much. So any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. And, uh, next is working group seven, hot net remediation uh, Michael O'Riordan mediation all right then um, okay the aim of this working group oh it's great it's got my name right it starts well um, <laughs> Um, the working group's going to review the um, work that's been done on botnet remediation on a global basis. Um, there's been a lot of focus on the Australian code of practice, and there's quite a lot of work been going on in the United States, uh, particularly in the IETF, where there's a um, draft which has just gone to last call on the subject of botnet remediation. And what we're looking at doing is building on the work of the CISRIC 2 Working Group 8 to come out with an agreed-upon set of voluntary practices which become um, a framework for ISPs to opt in. Um, we're going to look at what the potential obstacles are to um, getting ISPs to do this. And the FCC is obviously going to look to help us to encourage people to do so. And then finally, look at um, bot metrics. And I think this is a particularly tricky subject. Um, a lot of ISPs don't even measure the amount of bots that are on their network. You get security companies making pronouncements left, right, and center. Just recently, one security company came out and said 18% of all US home computers are infected with bots at the moment. And then, you know, about a day later, another security company comes out and says well, there's about 5 million globally. Well, those two statements are pretty much diametrically opposed. And um, so you can see the challenge that we face here. Um, next slide, please. There's quite a lot of work going on elsewhere. You've got the, um, the IETF bot remediation draft. Uh, Morg, the organization I chair, made some recommendations back in 2009, which are actually really just a subset of the stuff that's in the IETF draft, but we wanted to get something out fairly quickly. There was a bunch of work done in CISRIC 2 and Working Group 8. You've got the Australian iCode, um, which has been published and is in, pra is in operation now in Australia. Um, there's an interesting initiative in Germany, which is the botfry.de which is effectively a call center 
that has been set up for the ISPs customers to call in and to get directed to, to cleaning um, s resources. There's the Japanese CyberClean Center which has been operating and I believe has a sort of sign up rate of about 90% of all the ISPs in Japan and, and they work very closely with the security companies over there and that, that's been working for a number of years now. The Dutch got together and the IS leading ISPs there signed what the ISP treaty but there's not been a stunning amount of activity that I can detect over there. Um, just recently I found out about some work that's going on in Finland through the Finnish CERT where they provide, coordinate and provide a lot of bot information to ISPs and they've got some rather interested automating to automated tools. And finally there's um, a bunch of metric work going on at, at MORG and um, we're going to try and leverage that. Um, next slide please. Very much a draft work plan. I mean, we're aiming to get perhaps a voluntary code out an initial draft January 2012, March 2012. Develop an implementation, an implementation plan for sort of mid, mid of 2012. And I've put date TBD for bot metrics. This one is, is a challenge because, you know, you've got to get people measuring in order to have metrics. And I think that's, that's going to be a challenge. I mean, I think one of the things we've got to really consider, this is, a, this is an ecosystem. And it's not just the ISPs that, that, that have bear responsibility here you've got the security companies and the tools vendors because the tools are challenged by the bad guys. You know, the fact is the bad guys can turn out bad code quicker than the tools companies can respond. So we've got a big problem there. Um, the operating system vendors and the application vendors themselves need to be writing secure code. I think that's very important. Um, and then you've got the ISPs who, you know, have the customer relationship. So you can't look on this solely as you target the ISPs and say, you know, fix it ISPs. And I think that's going, that's going to be a challenge to get across. In terms of the work schedule, uh, we've got a first call set up for la latter part of this month where we'll start um, dividing up the work. Um, and we're going to be planning some face-to-face -face meetings. The aim is to meet um, every two weeks or fortnightly for the English on the, on the committee. Um, that's me. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. Uh, we're going to ask uh, Ari Schwartz to uh, speak with us. Ari is the Senior Internet, Internet Policy Advisor for the National Institute for Standard and Technology. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm coming in at this space because we've, at the Department of Commerce, we've been working with the Department of Homeland Security um, on a request for information on this issue of botnet notification and uh, w working with Michael and with uh, Jeff and others uh, at, at, um, f from the CISRIC, on the CISRIC work, uh, we felt that it was important to, um, to describe basically what we're trying to do and how we plan to work together uh, at this time. So uh, on Wednesday, we put out in the Federal Register a, this request for information, um, which is the goal of which is to promote um, the creation of a code of conduct uh, for voluntary um, notification um, of consumers uh, who have been in infected with botnets and uh, incentives for uh, companies to engage in that, in that process in a voluntary way. Uh, we cited a lot of the work that was done in the CISRIC2 uh, group and we, can, we hope that we can continue a uh, coordination between the work that we're doing uh, inside the Department of Commerce with DHS um, and the work that CISRIC is doing towards promoting that code. So uh, we're going we're to stay on a uh, pretty uh, aggressive time frame, uh, at least for, the, for uh, government work. And uh, we have the, the, the comments are due on November 4th through this process. We have a very wide open set of questions. Um, and uh, they, they do uh, point to the types of best practices that are put forward in uh, this is RIC2 work and, and some of the other uh, efforts that uh, Michael mentioned before. Um, we also uh, are talk, have quite a number of, of questions about incentives um, we, we're, because that's really where we, we, we see that our value added here is how do we go about promoting incentives um, that uh, can be to keep this in a, done in a voluntary way uh, to promote efforts in this space. Um, so uh, if uh, the, the working group can stay on its time, time frame and we can stay on our time frame where I think we're going to have a, a good deal to coordinate with. Um, and we'll be able to stay on that in that work. We have uh, folks from NIST working in, in inside the working group, so we will we should be able to uh, stay coordinated. But I think it's important for 
uh, the members of this work of this uh, of the CISRIC to understand uh, that when you hear talk about uh, the uh, what the Department of Commerce and, and DHS are doing in this space that we have been communicating on a weekly basis and uh, that uh, Michael and, and I also have been uh, discussing steps forward and we're, we're going to have some events coming up soon and we n hope that the FCC and uh, members of this working group group can participate in that effort. Thank you. Any questions for Ari? Anybody? Thank you, Ari. All right. Working group eight, best practices. Uh, Robin, again. Good morning again. And I know what you're thinking. Hey, it's that guy. And that's okay. Um, so just briefly, I'll spend a couple minutes about uh, talking about working group eight, uh, the E911 best practices. Um, so this working group, uh, the description is that 911 service reliability is vital to public safety and consumer well-being. CISRIC II and before that, ENRIC, have worked over the years to develop a substantial body of voluntary best practices to promote 911 reliability. So this working group will review the existing set of CISRIC and ENRIC 911 best practices and recommend ways to improve them, accounting for the passage of time, technology, uh, changes and operational factors. Uh, we have a due date for delivery of our final report of June 6, 2012. So the next slide is the list of participants uh, that we have so far on Working Group 8. Uh, we do have a, a really good uh, uh, variety of, of, of organizations, so I'm really happy to see that. Uh, so that's going to let us uh, really address some of the, uh, the gaps and the issues that we've seen on previous CISRICs and some of the recommendations that have uh, been made. Uh, next slide, please. So our current work activity, uh, again, we're, we're, uh, we are still early in, in getting the working group uh, established, so we're working on our logistics and uh, getting all of our uh, email exploders uh, scheduling and committees all uh, set up. Uh, we're working on uh, having our first kickoff meeting next week. Um, we are going to be identifying the expertise gaps that we have so that we can reach out and uh, try to fill those uh, using your assistance. Uh, we are in the process of collecting the data that we need to analyze as far as the existing best practices. Uh, we are uh, also looking at the past Enric and CISRIC final reports and looking for any uh, previous recommendations that we can pull into this team as necessary to address the best practices. Next slide. So far, uh, our team, um, we've compiled a list of existing best practices related to 911. Uh, we've gone in using the ADIS uh, uh, best practice website. We, you know, you can do keyword searches and different types of category searches. So we've been able to collect uh, a, a good set of data that we'll begin with. Uh, the other part of this that uh, I felt would be a very um, integral part of, of this process is that we contacted the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau and asked them to provide a <coughs> list of the best practices that have been referenced by service providers in all of our outage reports over the last six to seven years. So um, just to make sure that those best practices uh, are appropriate for 911, and if and if they are appropriate, and we find that they're not really tagged as 911, we'll we'll go ahead and make those recommendations as well. Uh, and there's several hundred of those that that I've seen. Uh, we did get a list of those, I believe, on Thursday. Next slide, please. Uh, the working group eight next steps. Uh, very important part of this process, I believe, is a best practice tutorial for all working uh, team members. Uh, I know that I made a comment about bad best practices earlier this morning, um, and by saying that, it's that the structure of a best practice is very important, and the tutorial teaches how to create a good best practice and not just a good idea. Uh, good ideas are just that. They're not best practices. So we, uh, I'm very, very big on that, and uh, the NRSC also stands by. Uh, to assist any team on best practice creation um, as the council and uh, FCC sees fit. Um, we are looking at defining the best practice review process and the validation process uh, so that we do get a good set of best practices, uh, distribute the information out to the team, uh, then again identify any of the best practice gaps or concerns recognized by the experts that we've collected and then begin working on the Working Group 8 report. 
And the last slide is a tentative timeline. Uh, again, we have until June of 2012. So we have a uh, series of touch base, um, full counts or full working group calls, uh, sub team calls, and uh, some of the major uh, milestones that we're hoping to hit uh, over the next several months. So are there any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you again, Robin. Uh, working Group 9, uh, alerting issues associated with uh, cap migration is, is still being formed. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot to say about this issue, but nobody say it today. So we'll uh, be finalizing the leadership of that, uh, that group uh, in the very near future. I want to just make a note, uh, let you know that Stacy Hartman of Century Link is chair of the steering committee. Uh, to uh, coordinate the working groups and Stacy is uh, available to answer any questions you may have about coordination of the working groups or other uh, related uh, entities that may be involved. Stacy, you stand just so what else, those we haven't met you. Thank you. Anything else to be brought to the uh, committee's attention, to the council's attention today? I have, uh, I have a quick question. I was wondering if the um, committee is still considering uh, recommendations for additional companies to be brought to bear in some of the working groups. Is that still active? So I know in the um, next generation alerting, I don't see how we could do that effectively without Twitter and Facebook um, being part of that. I think um, that's become part of the fabric of how we do emergency communication and uh, seemed like a big omission. Um, also thought in the uh, botnet remediation probably makes sense to your point uh, that some of the OS vendors, um, certainly Microsoft and others, be um, invited to participate. Um, they may be already. I didn't see their name there. Microsoft's there. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, you're nominating yourself, Ed? <laughs> no, no, well, I don't work at Microsoft. So. No, 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 no. I know, I know I that. Twitter, Twitter would be a good addition to the um, uh, emergency alerting. Okay. Um, and to, but to answer your question in the first instance, the, for all the working groups, the, the uh, time frame to nominate folks to serve on the working groups is still open. So please uh, keep, uh, if, you, if you have folks who want to serve on the groups, keep sending them um, to, uh, to myself, um, to Stacy. Um, we'll make sure that you have those email addresses so that so you, you know how to do that. And, um, and as a matter of fact, it really never closes. So if, if the working group chairs identify folks they want to bring on board in the middle of the cycle, that can be done, okay? Thank you, Jeff. Other questions or items we brought before the council? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, Bill Smith. Bill Smith with is the mic on? Okay, sorry, I can't tell here. Bill Smith with PayPal on. Following up to Ed's uh, comment um, on alerting, I, I would think uh, in we want to consider beyond uh, Facebook, Twitter. There are going to be other major players uh, delivering applications. I think on the web, and also I would su potentially suggest browser vendors um, that if we're really looking to get alerts. Um, that may be a place to do it and ask for play space in um, uh, the Chrome of the, the browsers themselves. So I think that may be something to consider. So the request is that we, uh, if there are other key participants that should be in the working groups or in part of this council, please uh, let us know. Please submit them to Jeff or, or others here and we'll, we'll work to get them on. Uh, the sooner the better, though. The recommendation I had earlier was that within the next two weeks, if there are folks we want to add, so we can get them in as soon as possible. So if you will, uh, submit those within the next two weeks and so we can have those to uh, consider and, and, and probably add to the council. Any, anything else? Any other questions? Any other input before? Just uh, want to say how much I appreciate uh, the group that's here, the, the time you spent here. Obviously, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of work to do here. Uh, some very important projects going on with this group, and uh, this can be really uh, impactful uh, for, uh, for our, our companies, for our nation, Homeland Security, and 
public safety. So I encourage you to keep in mind how important this is, and I will. Work, I, I promise to work to be sure this time is not wasted. Uh, we're here to, for a purpose. I know Chairman Janikowski is serious about uh, the work of this this group, and we'll we'll consider it seriously. So uh, thank you again for your time. Our, our next meeting, uh, CISRIC meeting, it will be December 16th. So I look forward to seeing you then. And again, thank you for being here today. At this time, I'll turn it over to Jeff to close the meeting. And before I do that, Jamie, uh, do you have a few words to, to say? Just to just to reiterate, reiterate uh, what uh, Glenn has said, we, we greatly appreciate uh, what you're bringing to this. We have great expectations. I know that uh, the work of CISRIC III will be very important to the future of the nation. Uh, and Glenn, once again, thank you for your leadership. And I hope when we see you again, uh, we, uh, we haven't um, descended into winter. I think this is the second day of fall. And so, um, but the, uh, the holiday season will be here and, and I'll be looking forward to seeing everybody then. So have a safe trip wherever you're headed and, uh, and a good weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.